the apparent failure, perhaps, of the, the, the rationalist atheist types to develop a, an active ethos that has sufficient beauty and motivational power to serve as a credible replacement for the religious rituals. Mm. So there's, there seems to, there must be a reason why that's, that failure has occurred, yeah. right? So, yeah, so well, do you have I, any I sense of what yeah, the reason might be? I can give you a, a short list of reasons. One is that traditionally the impulse to do that in a religious context has been fatal, right? So to declare your apostasy has been the, the almost as reliable a way of committing suicide as jumping off a building in most cultures and most societies for the longest time and still is in many places, as you know, in the Muslim world. So uh, it, there, it, there's been a barrier to entry to thinking creatively about alternatives to religion. And so much of atheism and secularism is just a, 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 a pitched battle against the the eroding power of religion. I mean, when religion really has its power, right, we know what it's like. I mean, the, the, you know, the, again, I think we spoke about this at one point, you know, the, just the, the moment that it makes this most salient is, you know, Galileo being shown the instruments of torture by men who wouldn't look through his telescope, right? I mean, that's, that was the point of contact between untrammeled human rationality and the, the womb that bore it. Right, re, re, the, re, the religious awe at, at the beauty of the heavens, right? So the moment wo a person like Galileo stepped a little too far, and to connect this to astrology again, Galileo was a court astrologer, right? I mean, so they, they were, there, was a con there was a point of contact between astronomy and astrology at that point. So uh, we're still under the shadow of that kind of dogmatism and oppression in much of the world. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, it's still in the United States, you cannot run for the presidency without pretending to believe in God. It's amazing. It's an amazing fact, right? When will that change? It, it, someday it will, but we have, we have just had almost no time, no time. But, but to experiment also, in this space but, and innovate well, in this space. Well, there's been some time, there have been some decades, and I suppose the thing that unites, Sam, uh, unites Jordan and me on this is if, if we face some of the problems, some of the enemies, you might even say, that you identify as well. And the question is whether you should face them in the midst of an experiment that may or may not work, i.e. a leap into pure rationality, or whether you might decide it's worth, among other things, taking some of the versions of things that you've had that have been of worth in your past and using them where they're useful. But, but what are you picturing there? Because there, there really is no leap, there's no global leap to pure rationality. There's just, there's this incremental er erosion of religious answers to terrestrial questions. So there's, the, the, again, the, the moment you, you have a science of neurology, you begin to look at epilepsy not as demonic possession, but as a neurological problem. Before there's a science of neurology, you don't know what the hell's happening. Right, so so into that well, space. Some, something obviously drove Douglas, I would say, in in some s sense, um, surprisingly, to make the assumption that one of the things that we need to do to defend whatever it is that we have of value in the West, assuming that we have anything of value, was something like the reincorporation of this religious substructure, so why, it's not something that I would have expected no. you to conclude. Yeah, but what, what so are you why picturing? did you conclude it? Well, partly for the reason I just suggested, um, that the leap into pure rationality, there's no evidence yet that it's going to work, or it's going to be enough, or enough people are going to be able to partake but, in but, it. But, but, but give me the and precise uh, moment, place where you're worried that it's going to fail, and what, can you, what are you imagining well, well, you doing? Well, you think it's failing you, now. Yeah, let me give you one example. Yeah. I mean, we may be in the midst of the discovery that the only thing worse than religion is its absence. And, and where? Where are we discovering that? Look at the religions that people are making up as we speak. I mean, every day there's a new dogma, and you and I and Jordan have repeatedly tripped over those dogmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some it usually survived, right. it has to be said, but... Um, this, they're, they're, they're stampeding to create new religion all the time at the moment. Every every new heresy that's invented. 
and they're not as well thought through as past heresies, they don't always have the bloody repercussions yet, but you can easily foresee a situation in which they do. I mean, a new religion is being created as we speak by a new generation of people who think they are non-ideological, who think they're very rational, who think they're past myth, who think they're past story, who think they're better than any of their ancestors and have never bothered to even study their ancestors. Right. So, but can't you say that dogmatism is the problem? The generic problem here is dogmatism, the firm belief uh, in the absence of good argument and good evidence. And absolutely, we can agree that dogmatism of any kind has that danger, or will always have that danger. But the void also has a danger. The void that you can create if you throw out all the stories that helped get you to where you are also has this danger, because people come up with these new stories. And every day's news now is about this. Every, our politics is now basically about this. Uh, I mean, well, actually... Yeah, and, what, and what's flown in to fill the gap seems to be something like a new tribalism. Absolutely. Which is exactly what you'd expect in some sense, right? If you, if you demolish the superordinate system, you know, religion divides people, no doubt, but it also unites people. Yes. And so one of the things that arguably unites people above their mere tribalism is their union in an abstract religious superstructure. Yeah. And then if you demolish that, well, then one of the things that does seem to happen is the emergence of a reflexive tribalism because people need a, need a group identity of sorts. And the easiest thing to do seems to be to revert to ethnicity and race and gender and sex, etc., etc. And then we do end up and have ended up in this situation that Douglas outlines. And, you know, one of the things I think that distinguishes us temperamentally, possibly, maybe because you're a little more on the liberal side and I'm a little more on the conservative side, even temperamentally speaking, mm -hmm. is that your fundamental terror is that of fundamentalism, although you also state in the moral landscape that you understand the, the, the perils of nihilism. And I would say my fundamental terror is that of nihilism, even though I'm sensitive to the catastrophes of fundamentalism. But I don't think you do address the problem of the void sufficiently. I, because I don't think that you have anything to offer except, an, ex, and I'm, I'm not trying to minimize your offering. You, you make a case that people should work to alleviate suffering and that we should live in truth, but Jesus, Sam, you can summarize that in two sentences. It doesn't have the yeah. potency of, well, of, the, of the fictional, literary, artistic substructure that seems necessary to make that into something that's, that's a compelling story. Well, so and, a, this is where we might disagree. This could be a fundamental disagreement. Because I, I actually, I don't see the problem of nihilism the way you do or the way it's advertised. Like it, it, once you rip out the false certainties and the bad evidence and the bad arguments and, the, and the, the mere dogmas imposed on us by prior generations, that hole never closes safely with anything else. You have to put something in its place that's shaped just like that. Some other false certainty or some other story I simply don't think that's the case. I think there's so many things we outgrow, both individually, uh, you know, if, in our ch own childhoods, and culturally, that where th there, is no, there is no void left. There's no Santa Claus-shaped void that we have to fill with the exact but same experience, thing. But people certainly experience that Some people, void. Yeah, people I, I'm not discounting the fact that it is hard to be happy in this world. I mean, we, we are living in a world that seems designed, okay, so, perfectly designed, to frustrate our efforts okay. to find permanent happiness. So you asked me, uh, you put me on the spot a while back. But let, let me just, yep, but let me just add, add the, my answer to this. I yep. just think that there's the recipe for a good life, or at least, at least uh, a, a, a minimal recipe for a good life. It's not that this is all that's entailed, but this is, this is, this is certainly necessary, if not sufficient, is to live a life that is increasingly motivated by love and guided by reason, right? You can't go very far wrong if you are motivated by love and guided by reason. 